EIA report. And the EIA report is telling us, um, let me make sure it's the right one. It is not, this is not even close. February 26th. What? What? Petroleum status report. Blah, 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 blah. February 26th. I'm sorry, this is March 10th. This is not even close to the right report. Um, well, all right, so much for that. Anyway, the bottom line is there, there was a, a, another huge building in oil. And, and to some extent, that's because refineries were shut down or whatever. This one says the 26th, too. Isn't that weird? This is last week's report, 21.6 million barrel bill. So last week, there was a 21.6 million barrel bill. This week, there's a 13 million barrel bill. And the thing about that is that, um, let's look at uh, data, imports, exports, stocks. Let's look at stocks. And uh, let's see if we can find uh, prices. Reserves and production, crude oil reserves, 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 changes in productions. Okay, hopefully that's going to tell us. Oh, no grass. I want grass. Um, analysis and projections, inventories and stocks. Fuel source? Okay. Petroleum? Wow, look how much crap there is. I just want a freaking chart. Petroleum. Oil petroleum. 106, 108 things. And what do we want to find out about? The, the, well, there's the gas storage report. Heating oil propane this week in petroleum. That would probably be good. This week in petroleum should have some information. <laughs> There we go. Crude oil contracts, stocks. That's what I wanted to find. All right. So as you can see, and again, this doesn't include obviously this week, but as, all right. So let's say, you know, you can see the spike up here. So it's more important where you are in this channel. Here's the uh, five-year range. And when you're above the five-year range, like we have been, that's definitely bad for prices, right? And so we went and dipped below it, but now we're firing right back up. And now we've got another huge bill this week. Probably was well, going to be about half of what that one was. So up to here. And if the next couple of weeks we still have these bills, we're going to be right back to the top of the range in a very dangerous territory for oil. And uh, gasoline, also very weird sort of plungy sort of thing. Now that, that plunge though was caused unnaturally. The plunge wasn't caused by demand. The plunge was caused by the refineries being shut down. They weren't producing the gasoline. But on the other hand, that's also why the oil is building up, right? They, the, the refineries couldn't make the gasoline. So the gasoline stockpile went down, but they also couldn't use the oil. So the oil stockpile went up. So it, it kind of evens out. It's, it's all very silly actually. Um, same thing with distillate went down. Everything, everything got used, right? Because they had to take it out of production, out of stockpiles because they weren't producing more. So it's very hard to go by any of these numbers right now. <clears throat> OPEC did not change their production schedule at the last meeting. And, you know, call that good or bad, it means you're going to keep going on the trend. But the trend for oil has not been a good trend on the whole. You know, if we repeat last year, this year, we're going to be in big trouble. They're going to be way, way over um, their goal. But, you know, they think the world economy is coming back. People are going to start driving again, so on and so forth. And this is the U.S., of course. And, uh, you know, so by the summer, they expect that, they're, they're, they, that you'll be catching up and you won't get back up to the top of this range. We will see what's going to happen. But in the last few weeks, or well, not the last few weeks, in the last few days, oil has done this. So here we were last week. And, you know, we, we played, we took the dip money, went back up, we took, we shorted again. There wasn't much of a dip here, it went back up, that was painful. 
but we, you know, but if you stick with it, it comes back down again. And you know, if you if you had and and I did, I had like two, you know, two short here, made some money. Uh, there was no shorting opportunity here again. We didn't get another shorting opportunity until 64. Shorted 64, didn't make any money. Goes way back up here. No, obviously no, you know, we stopped out, of course, when it goes over 64. But um, got up to 65, didn't stop there. I think I tried at 65 to short, and that didn't work out at all. Um, then it went 66. It went to the over 66, it went to 67. And by that time, I added a couple of short contracts, and we kind of worked our way back down from there. But all this is silly. You know, the, you, you can see the bigger trend lines. This is the top of the range. Uh, if you go on a daily chart, you can see, like, you know, where you're way, way, way off where we were for the last, you know, more than a year. Go to the weekly chart. And somewhere between here, the rear range is really, like, here, 40 to 70 is your is your major range for oil. So when you're up near 70, it's a good time to short it, it really is. Um, could it go higher? Of course it can go higher. You know, I mean, it, it's a percentage play. It's not likely to go higher. Um, if you consider almost any kind of bet on oil to be a 50-50 bet, right? It's like a roulette wheel, right? There are, no, there are not many numbers below 10. There are not many numbers above 70. So if you, if you can make the same amount of money just betting it won't go below 10 and it won't go above 70, you'll do well. If it's a 50, if you're being paid 50-50, you wouldn't be paid 50-50 just to say it won't go a certain to the edges of the numbers. But that is how it works in this. You you know, you bet, you make a 50-50 bet, but you make the 50-50 bet when it's very unlikely that one side of that bet is going to pay off. But sometimes it does. And when you're in the short-term view, you see yourself getting really, really burned, but that's why we stop out. That's why we always say tight stops above. We were all gung ho to short, but we had tight stops above, so that didn't work. You know, we we shorted here, didn't work. Shorted here, I mean, you know, it worked and then it didn't. 62 was fine once, twice, nice payoffs, but then it doesn't work. But that's okay because if you stop out, it's no big deal. Then you get to the next level where it finally pauses, and you say, okay, I'll short it when it gets below 64. Goes below 64, goes right back up, below 64, right back up. As long as you stop out, no big deal. Then you say 65. Well, that didn't work at all, so that's out. And again, you lose 100, 200, 100, 200, but here you're making 1,000, and here you're making 1,000. And here, well, I mean, look, as you can see, here we're making 16,000. You just got to get it right once. <laughs> you don't have to get it right every time. You have to get it right once. So anyway, so bounces, that's what we're talking about. So um, I actually was only 4,000 per contract, there's four contracts. Um, so bounces, so now we're falling, but we're kind of falling from 65. I don't want to say we're falling from 60. We never should have been here. This was based on rumors and bullshit and, uh, and, and uh, the Saudi thing, they got attacked. Remember they have that, that that attack of the rebels were attacking one of their uh, refineries or some bullshit like that in Saudi Arabia. Something that honestly doesn't affect any kind of production or anything, had no effect on anything else. But that it was an excuse to ramp up oil into the weekend, and that was great. They loved that. And they took it as high as they possibly could, which turns out to be 68 bucks is about as high as they could possibly get it. And then no more catalyst, so it comes back down comes back down to where it comes back down to the top of the range, which is 64 right now. So, you know, so so 65, let's say, let's give let's give them 65, say 65 is, is the top. We only came back a little bit so far. You know, we had a run from 60 to 65. We had a big overshoot, but let's just throw that out and say that's just silly. And, and if you look at a daily chart, of course it's silly. It doesn't mean anything. Here's uh here's 65. You couldn't even call that like a real line. Yeah, 6500. There's no, there's no, I'm pointing. Uh, I'm pointing with my finger, you can't see that. There's no hard evidence along this line that, that 65 is any kind of support for the last year. It's nothing. It's a it's a level that hasn't been made yet. Now, of course, you can say the same thing about the S P, right? But it's a level that hasn't really existed. So, you, you know, that's not something you bet on coming back. What, what you bet on coming back is this. This is where, this has been the sweet spot for oil is down in the 40s. 
you know, maybe you can make a case and say, oh, look at 50. 50 is probably going to be good support. So, yeah, in a recovering market, 50 should be good support. But we're miles above 50, so I want to keep my short. The problem is it's, dang, you know, it's obviously very dangerous. Um, but you've got to play the bounce game, though. So let's let's say that 65, 60, 66, 66. Let's say 66 is where we really were. You know, we came up to 66, and if it hadn't been for the uh, for the rebel thing, probably around here is where it flattened out. So if we say we go from 66 back to, um, I'm sorry, if, you, if 66 and minus 5% for one thing. Calculated calculator. So 66 times 0 0.95, 62.70. So our goal is basically 63, 62.70. That's where we're going to expect to have support anyway. So as I said, I was hoping to see 62.50, but probably it's unrealistic because that would be more than a 5% pullback from 66, which is where we think it really is consolidated. It would also be like 10% back from here. So there's two reasons it's not going to get that far down. So realistically, 63 probably going to be a bouncy line. It already has bounced once. And the question is, was that a strong bounce or a weak bounce? Well, if it's down 63, 60, if it's down from 66 to 63, that's $3. Then your bounces are going to be 60 cents, 20% of the drop. So it's uh, 63.60 and 64.20. And here's a 6420 line. So really, this is this is already over a weak bounce. This is a strong bounce. And and since I'm going to stop out at 64, I, I, I'm kind of screwed if it goes to the strong bounce. You know, but but again, it's, it's plenty of money, and we're not looking to be crazy. Uh, I I just do really, you know, fundamentally, I don't see I see oil coming back to 60. I don't see why it's as high. I don't see any good reason for it. Um, I don't see any more catalyst. Okay, the OPEC thing's over. The rebel attack is over. They don't usually do a lot of them at once. They do them once in a while when they really need a boost. <laughs> so um, that's over. I'm not sure what the next catalyst for oil will be. Yeah, um, we have Easter coming up, but that's not a big driving holiday. Um, nothing until Memorial Day or Labor Day or whatever day it is they have in May. Um, and uh, then the virus thing. So I guess the next thing to do would be to figure out if the virus is still a thing. We haven't done that in a long time. So let's take a look at that. That's uh, K O H N S. That's not how you spell it all. Johns. Ah. Johns Hopkins COVID. Okay, thank you. So let's see, 44,000 cases, that's pretty good. I think we were like 100,000 a day, now we're doing 44,000 a day, so that's nice. Um, do they still have that thing? Where's that map? Animated maps. This doesn't seem right. Tracking home, global map. There, that's the thing we like to use. Okay. So where are we? Wow. 30 million. Wow. Remember when like Brazil was catching up to us? That's Brazil is the second worst country in the world. Right? India's got so many people, it doesn't count. Um, Brazil's the second worst country in the world. And they were catching up to us, but they have now fallen behind considerably. They're now, we, we now have three times more cases than they do. Is it, is that how you say it? Three, three times more? Yeah, it's one times more. It would be, no, you can't have one time. No, if you say three times more, three times as many cases, that's how you do. That would be the proper way to say it. Um, woof, wow. But this is such a shame, right? Um, wow. Okay, anyway, so, so, so gigantic major number of, of the United States still going on. Uh, 2.6 million people dead in the world, and 20% of them are in America. Um, 
367 million tests. Well, good job testing at least. All right, so we have the testing coming up. Uh, how are we doing overall in the US? What's happening? Global deaths, it's not really telling you. All right, 527,000 deaths. I guess this is our um, cases. Oh, here you go, cases. So, you know, it was super duper out of control. And then it started trailing off nicely. And now it's, I mean, he, you know, we were, we were getting around 300,000 cases when we were peaking in a day. 300,000 in a day. Look, there's, these are the times, this is every country in the world. And, and, and 300,000 cases in a day would be how many in a week? We fit 1.5 million a week. So every week, we're doing as much as Iran or South Africa's total cases, and these are the worst countries in the world. Every week, we were, I'm sorry, it's 2.1 million, right? So we were in Argentina territory. It's not, it's not 200,000, it's 300,000. So we were adding this number, Colombia, Argentina, every day. Germany, the whole country of Germany's cases, we were adding on a, on a weekly basis. That's insane. We were we were heading into a doomsday scenario. If Trump had been reelected, we would still be on that path. It's astounding. I mean, could you imagine that was what two months ago now? So that would be uh, four weeks, and we would be at it. We we'd be up at uh, we have what like 10, 10 million more cases than we have now. We'd be at forty million. It might have gotten more if somebody kept going up. Now we'll see what happens because now these states are lifting restrictions, which is what we did here. You know, last year in, uh, you know, for the for the holiday weekend, right? Everybody said, "Oh, it's okay. We're coming down. Same thing. We're coming down. Let's get rid of our restrictions. Let's let everything go." And we went. And, and this is the thing, though. We only had twenty thousand cases a day back then. We now have 50,000 cases a day, and we're reopening. We've only vaccinated 10% of the population. So if you take this growth from, from 20,000 to 70,000, right? And then you, you take, say, and then you somehow take 90% of that and you say, well, okay, it won't be, it'll be only eight, it'll be only be 90% of that growth because 10% of the people are vaccinated. That's not that helpful. That's still going to get us back to 150,000. We don't want to be at 150,000 again. That's bad. Um, but anyway, so. I know things are better because we, if it looked, things were horrifying. So of course things are better than horrifying, but you can't just, <laughs> it's like you have a heart attack and they tell you to cut out this and cut out that and cut out this. And then you go, oh, okay, I survived. And now, and now I'm going to go back to eating all this crap. And then, you know, what's going to happen? You, you got to keep it up. You can't not keep it up. You're not out of the woods. Um, so, so that, you know, it's, I think it's just so bad to like throw this out stuff out. It's a shame. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's actually going to happen to me. And I really don't. It's, it's crazy. But it, it, again, it's, it's just the problem I have with it is, is again, you'll say, okay, record highs because all these companies are projecting how everything's going to be amazing in the second half of the year. Why? Because they have a ton of money. Everyone's throwing money at everybody right now. The consumers have a ton of money that they're not spending. Uh, all things that, you know, people are getting checks and all kinds of crap, and the companies are getting checks, and everyone's got money, and everybody plans on spending everything. But what's the reality going to be? What's really going to happen this summer? And that remains to be seen. Um, supposedly, this being the Ides of March, basically. So uh, supposedly in the next 60 days, 75 days, we're all gonna be vaccinated. Then we can do whatever we want. 
and it's orgy time, as I said yesterday. <laughs> it's time to party. And, and, and you know, it's funny, I think part of the reason you have the roaring 20s where everybody really was partying for, for, you know, for a good part of a decade was they went through the same kind of thing we're going through, right? In 1918, 1919, the, the whole world was locked down in a pandemic. You know, they just had a war. That was terrible. And then they come home from war carrying this disease around the world where every, where unbelievable, I mean, way worse than this one, you know, 25 million people died or some crap like that. Um, we've only had, we've only had 2.6 million people die with modern medicine. They have like 25 people, million people died. Uh, or 15 million, some huge number, some ridiculous number that makes you sick, especially because the world population was one tenth of what it is now. And um, and then when that was gone, what did people do? People went nuts. They went partying. They had a good time. Great for the economy for a while, but we had a bubble and it burst. Now, we instead decided to party during the pandemic economically. So it'll be interesting to see what happens post-pandemic. But the thing is, we don't know that we're post-pandemic yet. We don't know this thing is over. We don't know if we're effectively going to contain it. We don't know if these policies are going to work or if we're making a mistake. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns, but we're betting, uh, you know, the market is betting that none of them matter. And I'm on the fence now. So, I mean, frankly, huge improvement. I'm on the fence. I would have, I would have been much more negative, but I have to tell you that... Um, this is really encouraging. The studies they're doing so far of people who have uh, had the vaccine and so on and so forth uh, do indicate that they can go back out and join the society. We had a couple of articles today about, um, excuse me, about um, what? Oh, I'm not logged in. No, not admin, Phil. Come on, that wasn't my article today. What is... Dun, 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 dun. PE4, okay, here, here's the thing. Okay, the internet, the internet. so here's the actual PE of the S&P 500. All-time high. All-time high by, by, by pretty good amount. Here's the, the, for, the actual PE. Here's the forward PE. So this is what companies believe is going to happen. Here's what really is happening. Okay, now, last year, the company's forward PE was uh, was here, it was down here. They didn't see this coming. They they projected that their PE would be down here. It actually turned out to be fifty percent higher. <laughs> so they were off by a bit. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so so now they're projecting still rosy, like all of a sudden we're going to go back to 20. We're going to go from 30% now, current, real, 30%. We're going to go back to 20%, which is a historical average, all in the course of a year without any averaging or any higher thing. It's nonsense. It can't be real. The only way you go from 30 to 20 is by going to like an actual of 12 and they average and, and the you know in other words you're starting the year at 30 yeah get down to 12 by the end of the year that's how you average 20. you're not going to average 20 when you're starting the, the year at 30. um <laughs> this is a real number this is a fantasy that they that they that they project um that bothers me a lot frankly uh, we, we'll look at the fourth, you know, when the first quarter results come in, we'll look at that and see how it goes, but it's we'll see how that goes. Oh, the stimulus vote is happening right now. Wow, 201, yes, 195, no. 
Nobody's abstaining. No Democrats have voted no yet. Um, what is that? Yay, nay. I don't know. Anyway, they're working on it. <clears throat> so anyway, so, so, you know, there's a big disparity between reality and expectations, and the market is priced on expectations. Here's your, uh, this is how the market is priced in, against GDP, and again, ridiculously high. When do we get this high? Before the market collapses. Yes, the market, we, we, we've been this high before, but then the market's completely collapsed after that. Um, I don't even know what this is. Oh, this is ISM. Here's another thing. We don't believe there's going to be inflation. Here's your 10-year note, which actually went up again today because they had an auction that went up again. Um, so the 10-year note's priced for no inflation, yet the reality is inflation is way the frick up there. 100% more actual inflation than is being reflected in the 10-year note. Generally, they're neck and neck. And that's and that's with the Fed pushing it down. That's the you know the Fed was here in 208 and 209, I believe they were pushing. They were keeping everything in check. And then and then here's the smoothing effect here. So you know, this gap is what the Fed can sustain over a long period of time. This gap is insane. We keep having inflation. These notebooks are gonna rise like this, and that's gonna frickin' be decimating for the, uh, devastating for the economy. Because that's not in our budget. That's not in Joe Biden's budget to pay an extra uh, 1% on $30 trillion of debt. That's a lot of debt. <laughs> it's three hundred billion dollars is one percent of, of three of thirty trillion. So that's, that's suddenly you're paying three hundred billion dollars more of interest only. It doesn't do anything for you. It's just an interest expense. Um, this was interesting. Two foreign holders of debt. No foreigners stopped buying our debt, especially in the last year. Dropped off 25% of the foreign holders stopped buying our debt. Well, who has to make that up? Well, the Federal Reserve has to make that up. They've got to buy it. If the foreigners aren't going to buy our debt, somebody's got to buy our debt, or this will go through the roof. Somebody has to say, yes, Mr. Yes, yes, Uncle Sam, I will lend you. I will lend you money for 10 years at 1.6% interest. That's how the auction works. Now, if nobody wants to lend it for 1.6, what has to happen? We still have to borrow the money. So we say, okay, we'll pay 1.7. If nobody wants to borrow for 1.7, you say 1.8. And if nobody wants to do that, about 20, 30, 50 bids later, you're freaking Greece. And you're standing there saying, oh, I'm so surprised. All of a sudden our debt went through the roof. And that's, and that's with a relatively strong currency. God help us if the currency starts weakening. Because when you're buying debt, you're buying the currency too, right? You're buying, I'm buying a debt to be paid back to me in US dollars in 10 years. So you're betting on two things. You're betting on inflation over 10 years. And that obviously is an idiotic bet. That inflation is only going to be 1.6% for the next 10 years. That's a ridiculous bet number one. All right, go think back 10 years and don't forget we had the Fed, we had a crisis 10 years ago or 12, 13 years ago, whatever the hell it was now, but we had a crisis, we had the Fed keeping rates low, we had the stimulus, we had everything else going on in the economy over the last decade and what happened? How much was Netflix 10 years ago? How much was, the, I mean, I don't know, the, how much was an iPhone 10 years ago? How much was uh coffee milk tea i don't know i mean what are you know things that you can think about how much were they 10 years ago they sure as shit won't weren't only 10 percent less than they are now right or or 16 percent less than they are now 1.6 percent so it's 1.6 percent annual that sure isn't going to do it for you is it definitely not netflix 
<laughs> so these are these are not necessarily good numbers. Oh, here's another one I didn't like at all. Um, this was um, this is the bond. This is the yield spread on the two tens, and generally when your yield spread is this low you're going to bounce back up here and when when have we bounced back here in 87 when we had a horrifying crash the snl crisis in 2001 the dot com crash and in 2008 the the uh the mortgage crisis what are they going to call this crisis we don't know yet here's 2005, 2005 to 2009, 206, 207, 208. See here, 208, la di da di da, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, ah, and then all of a sudden everything collapsed. So it's not here where everything collapses, it's we're getting to that point though rapidly where everything collapses. Where are we here? Here's 1999, March of 2000, things started going bad on the NASDAQ. But then a little bit later, things went bad. Oh, yeah, and then we had 9-11. By the time you get over here, we're into 9-11, total disaster. Um, and I don't remember the timeline of the SNL crisis, but you get the idea. We're, we're just now getting this warning signal that tells you we're about to have something very nasty happen. And you don't know what it is. It just, <clears throat> that's not the point, though. In other words, you know, when you were doing uh, Jenga, right? You got the great, you got the big tower blocks, and you know it's going to tip over. Is it going to tip over on this turn, the next turn, the turn after that? Don't know. Is it going to tip over because you take out this block or that block or that block? You don't know. But you know what you do know? It's going to tip over because you look at the thing and you say this can only handle about two or three more blocks and the whole thing is going to collapse that's what you do know you could have the cleverest players in the world you can have the world champion jenga players playing the game and you know what it's still going to freaking collapse that's what happens okay nobody built a jenga tower to the moon there's a physical limit on how much you can screw around on how, no matter how careful you are, no matter how carefully you arrange everything, no matter how good you are at estimating this, nudging that and pushing this and doing that, no matter how many gears and levers you pull in an economy or in a Jenga game, eventually the physics of the thing will catch up to you. There's an underlying fundamental physical element to the game. And that's what everybody is forgetting. And that's what this is screaming right now. You've passed the legal safe limit. Look at our home inventory. This is also really interesting, huh? Where have all the houses gone? So what causes a low home inventory? Well, first of all, uh, people aren't moving. And the reason people are moving is because they don't have the money to move. You know, we're, we're, there's a lot of people who are being bailed out on their homes. It's like couldn't, they can't live there except for mortgage forgiveness. That's a problem. Problem number two is you need to have to deposit money to buy your next house. That's, a, that's an issue. People can't get loans and can't do that kind of stuff. Issue number three, the home builders aren't building. All right, and, and you need you need housing turnover to have a robust economy. We don't have that at all. This is horrifying. This is incredibly, I mean, this is just, you know, this doesn't happen. Another massive warning sign that your economy is in deep trouble and you don't know it. Um, here's the... I don't want to call it a delinquency chart. Delin All right, delinquencies. Okay, so 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 the percentage of properties that are delinquent on their payments, twenty percent of the hotels are having trouble paying their 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 mortgages. 
8% of the retail operations are having trouble paying their, their, their mortgages, whatever. So 6% 6, 6 of all properties not able to pay. But what does that do? That's going to hurt the banks. Somewhere that's going to hurt the banks. They're going to, you know, at some point, if this doesn't improve drastically, and look at drastically, drastically being going back to pretty much zero, if this doesn't improve drastically, these banks are going to have to start writing this shit down. If they have to start writing it down, they take losses. And if they take losses, all those numbers that you look at for the S&P go out the window. And all those forward projections turn out to be bullshit. Just like in 2008, when nobody would freaking mark down the properties until it became a crisis, then everybody had to mark down the properties. And then everybody went, oh, hey, remember the, oh, yeah, remember those projections? Let's look at that. That's a good one. It's uh, 2008. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Where are we? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so here you go. In, um, in, 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 you know, the, in the middle of 2008, projections were getting better and better. We were in a mortgage boom. Everything was fantastic. Uh, we were flipping mortgages and writing paper and the banks were making record profit and blah, 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 blah. And everything was fantastic. And the forward projection PE of the S&P 500 was 10. And that's late in 2008. That's almost 2009. The projections going forward were that we were going to make so much freaking money that the PE of the entire S&P was going to be below 10 next year. That's what the Ford projection was by Jamie Dimon and uh, freaking Blank Fine and all the smartest guys on Wall Street and Warren Buffett was telling you that and everybody was telling you how fantastic it was and how great things were and how much money they were going to make and how super duper everything was and what happened a month or two later. Turned out the actual PE was 25. Turned out it was it was 150% worse than they told you it was going to be. Two and a half times what they told you. They had no freaking clue what they were talking about in their forward projections. Don't forget there's no, no meteor hit the earth in 2008. All it was was somebody looking at the books and saying, hey, this is wrong. You guys are calling, again, and it's very common sense, right? It's, you know what common sense is? Looking at a freaking two-bedroom house in Los Angeles and saying, you know what? That's not worth $2 million. I'm sorry, but that really isn't actually worth $2 million. Even though some idiot just bought it for $2 million, that person's an idiot. And our entire system of valuing houses is idiotic because our, our system of valuing houses is based on the lemming principle. It's like if, if, if this many people buy a house in a neighborhood and overpay by $500,000, then we're just going to say the whole neighborhood is worth $500,000 more. It's just because there's, there's supposedly an endless supply of idiots. But there's not. There's not an endless supply of idiots. There's not an endless supply of money for the idiots to bring to put on the table and buy houses with. There just isn't. Physical limitations exist. And you don't see it, and especially you don't see it when the freaking uh, government is printing. <laughs> Boy, it's very organized today. Everything ties together. So um, <laughs> when the government is printing uh, $20 trillion <laughs> of new money in the course of... Um, well, that, that's just debt. I mean, it's not even printing the money. But, but you know, the, the government, when the government borrows $20 trillion from 2008, from the last crisis until this crisis, when in the last two years they've, pr they've, taken, they've printed $8 trillion. So, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a problem. Because they're throwing more, because they're throwing half of our GDP over the course of two years. So 25% of our GDP is borrowed money. So of course, it doesn't seem like a problem. If I, 
If I'm losing two pints of blood a day out of a hole in the side of my body, and they keep infusing two pints of blood a day, they'll say, oh, there's no problem. He's fine. Just don't stop infusing the blood. You're not fixing the leak because you think I'm fine. And that's exactly what's going on on the SMP. We're not fixing the leaks. We, we are pretending everything is fine. Way to go now. Uh, too many charts. There we go. So we're pretending everything is fine. We're not fixing the leak. But God help us if we take away that stimulus. Because we'll be here in no time. We are, I'm sorry, we are here. <laughs> with, with the stimulus, this is where we are. This is with the $8 trillion being thrown at the economy. So that is how much is that eight trillion in two years? It's taken eight trillion dollars in two years to get us here, to keep us from being here. Eight trillion in two years. That means every half, two trillion dollars. Every six months, two trillion dollars. It is March. We got two trillion dollars. It'll last us until June because we were supposed to get this money in November, but we never got it. So this will be this, basically this is our first half money. In the second half, Democrats are already planning at least two trillion in stimulus. They're going to call it infrastructure spending to make it sound different than what they've already done. But I guarantee you that infrastructure spending is going to include unemployment and blah blah blah. And I know that people have been saying, how's that feel? How come you like attack the Democrats for debt deficit spending things when you used to attack the Republicans for other stuff? I'm like, I attack people for doing the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm not, I, I am a liberal. I'm not gonna say I'm not a liberal, but I mean, not like anti one party or the other. I'm anti bullshit. This is bullshit. This is insane. We, we did the, what the Democrats are doing, the pits of the office, they're refusing to address the, the budget. They're refusing to say we have to pay for this somehow. They, I mean, and again, it's not like the Republicans did anything differently. The Republicans ignored it completely. They, they said, oh, tax breaks and more spending. That's a great idea. So we, so we collect less money and spend more money. And that's how we're going to run our economy. The Democrats are saying, okay, no more tax breaks, but... <clears throat> more spending, but they're not reversing the tax breaks. They're not doing anything to collect this money. They've got no actual plan to balance the budget. And I, I do understand that you have to fix something first. You know, it's like you, you, it's like you pump up your tire to get to the gas station so that you can then have it fixed. You know, you don't like, you can't fix the tire where it is. You have to get to the gas station to fix the tire, but uh, this is not that. Oh, the NASDAQ's red again, holy crap. Funny, funny if the stimulus doesn't pass. Could you imagine the reversal in the market if the stimulus doesn't pass right now? Uh, if, I, if like a bunch of Democrats walk out and say, forget it, we're not doing this. So maybe I shouldn't talk about this stuff. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't influence anybody to like cast a vote and destroy America. Like, like they did in 2008, remember? It was uh, the Republicans refused to do that vote. And they, they did the TARP. And they, had the, you know, they first had the idea for TARP. They said, we absolutely have to do this, or these banks are going to collapse and blah, blah, blah. And so these freaking Republicans didn't vote for it. <laughs> and then that was when the market went down. It went down like a couple of thousand points a week within a week from uh, from that. But then they then they ran back and said, okay, I guess we'll get through the TARP. Um, so so I don't know. It, it'd be, it would be funny, but it wouldn't be funny as in it would be scary because we, we almost – we almost bankrupted the entire financial system back in uh, in uh, 2008. So that was a uh, that was a little bit scary at the time. I don't know if you guys remember, but remember, I mean, remember you couldn't like the the brokerage accounts went down and you couldn't do anything with your money and they shut the things down and you couldn't trade and uh, and the market was dropping a thousand points and nobody could transact on the freaking thing. Do you think you can sell? That's why hedging is so important. You think you can sell? when the market's collapsing, but you can't. Oh, shit. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, we're out. Not sell, buy. God damn it. <laughs> Which way are you going? 
in this three. Phi, got more than one. Bastard. All right, anyway, so I gotta shut that down. It's taking off on us. Mitchell says we are now vaccinating about, we are vaccinating about 10% now every two weeks, 2 million per day. That's not 10%. Okay, we got 300 million people in the country. So we got 30 million people. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I probably, all right, well, yes, but, but you got two doses or well, it depends who you're vaccinating, whatever. But he's saying that every two weeks we're vaccinating 10%. So that would mean that in two months, we're only going to vaccinate 50% of the country. That's absolutely not acceptable. I don't see how they're going to hit that goal. We are way off. We need we need to, obviously, and, and especially so you're talking about one shot. So so everybody's supposed to have two shots. So if you have to have two shots, you need 600 million uh, doses uh, given out, not 300 million. And we've only given out, and that's true, like almost everybody who's gotten the vaccine has gotten two doses. So the 30 million vaccine doses that we have distributed so far have only gone to 15 million people, uh, unless my experience here, and I'm going by Florida, but I can't imagine it's much different than the rest of the country. But my mom and her friends who are getting vaccinated, I can't, nobody under 65 can get vaccinated in Florida. Um, my mom and her friends who got vaccinated, they all get an appointment card. As soon as they get vaccinated, they get an appointment card to come back in a week or two and get the second shot. So, um, so there's no, um, so, so, so I, I'd be very surprised if it's more than 15, 20 million people who've actually been vaccinated in the country. So we're not even at 10%. And if they're only doing 2 million per day vaccines. They can't, obviously you can't double vaccinate people. In fact, they said they said somebody got two vaccines in a day, like in a hospital by accident or something like that. And um, and uh, the, the, it was a very bad effect. I, I, I'm not quite sure why that would be though. I'm not sure if that's a real thing. I just saw, I saw it in the news, but I didn't have a chance to really find out about it. Um, New Jersey's letting restaurants boost indoor capacity by 50%. Increase capacity by 50%, so it depends on from what to what, but probably 250% is what they mean. I'm just reading headlines on Bloomberg. Uh, American Airlines sees $45 billion of demand for their $10 billion debt sale. Oh, that's something we didn't even talk about in the Morning Post is, is yeah, these companies are, are raising money with debt too. Um, 10-year auction was not a total disaster. Well, that's great. Um, copper rebounds on Chile strike, China credit growth, blah, blah, blah. Nope, nothing exciting going on with the NASDAQ's red. That's not a good sign. So let's see what that looks like. Gonna have to get out of the rest of these oil contract points. What's going on there? There we go. Done. All right. So I, I actually lost it. That I lost a thousand plus dollars because I wasn't paying attention before when it was down here. I said I wanted to stop out by sixty-four, and we were and we made a quarter mistake, which is a good thousand-dollar mistake of more more than I wanted to lose. But on the whole, it was a good trade. So I, I made made lots and lots of money for the overall time. But just today is not good because I waited too long to get out. That's why you got to do that. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, we we're going to look at the more charts. So here's the Dow plowing ahead. Here's the uh, S and P thirty nine hundred. Very impressive. Here's the NASDAQ, 
weakening a bit. Remember 12.9 was where we said we would, uh, not 12.9, sorry, 13. I forgot what we were looking at. What were our numbers yesterday? We were talking about that. <laughs> Talked about Pfizer yesterday. But more importantly, we talked about the NASA. How's Tesla doing? Oh, giving it back a little bit from 700. Petrobras, we decided we liked yesterday. They'd have a nice day at 571. That was good timing. Here's Lloyd's. They're okay. You like them too. Lots of good new trades. Um, TLT. I know we talk. Ah, here it is. Okay. I'm sorry. So 12.9. Yeah, it was 12.9. So 12.9 and 12.780. So the 5% rule was telling us that we should be topping out at 12.9 on this run and then we should be taking a turn lower. So overall, I don't think that's exactly what happened. But Here's 12.9. Oh well, I mean, close, I mean, you know, I mean, you don't, you know, we had this early morning thing that went above 12.9, but that's the line we predicted would stop. Yeah, a little less. So there's 12.9, and that's what the five percent rule told us would be the end. We actually made it up to 13,000, but 12.9. And then pulling back, and then it was 12,660 or something like that. I don't know. 12,660. Oh, wow. Green's better than I thought. Uh, <laughs> so 780 and 660 are the lines we want to watch next. So 780 is where we are right now. Okay, that's a weak retrace off that run. And if that fails, then the next one is going to be 660. And frankly, 780, 660, it's a 100 point run on NASDAQ. It's good for $2,000 per contract. So that's not a bad little bet once you're below it. So uh, we are below 780. So you could bet right now uh, we're at 760. When you're close to 780, you just take the bet for short, keep a stop above 780, like at 785, and uh, play it down from there. It's very simple to do these sort of things on the futures. And what have we played this week? Did we um, see what we did Monday? I know we came up with a couple of trades. Oh, and we forget about that. There's this gigantic hack going on. It's still in progress where these Chinese hackers have attacked Microsoft mail servers taking all the corporate data and all the information, and it's so detrimental. <laughs> it's, I mean, imagine being in business and your competitors, like, reading all your emails. That's what this is. All these Chinese companies that get, get open access to American emails because their government hacks servers for them and things like that. Now, um, I don't know. I don't know if the answer is for our we we should either hack their servers, that would be one way to do it, or we should protect ourselves better. We don't put the kind of money into security that we should. We really don't. You know, networks are just far too too weakly protected. Look at GameStop again. Holy crap. <laughs> 265. Intel's plowing along, very happy with Intel. Because Apple's been weak and still weak today, down a hand, down a percent today. Somebody asked me about Apple. I said eight. I said, look, I want them, I want something bad to happen, so they go to 80. That's when I want to buy them. I don't want to buy them when they're bad. And I'm not saying it will happen, but it's unless it does, why am I gonna get involved? Tesla was great timing on Monday. We took out my we, we closed our Tesla trade on Monday. And uh, that was here. And that, by the way, that's a really important thing. We talk about that a lot. You have to have a target for a trade. Now, our target for this trade was clearly 600, right? 
we sold the 600 puts. That was our target. So it doesn't matter that we sold the 600 puts. What matters is that it was a $20 times four is an $80,000 spread. And 121 minus 43 was like $78,000. So it was 78,000 out of 80,000 possible dollars. We're done with that trade. It hit our target of 600. What are we going to do? Wait until the end of the year, or, or is it the end of the year? Um, well, we could have rolled it. I mean, it was rollable 600, but the point is we had a target of 600. It hit 600 way earlier than we thought. And you know Tesla's a crazy stock that can bounce, so why, why stick with it? And I said that to, um, to uh, uh, Jay. Um, I said, as to your short 1100s, because he had short 1100 calls, I said, it's doubtful Tesla goes back there and you have 52,000 left to gain, but make sure you're willing to deal with things if Tesla suddenly pops 20%. What did it do? It popped 20% like in two days, in the next two days. And basically yesterday it popped 20%. Back to 700-ish. That's exactly, I mean, I, I don't know. I can, I can only tell you what's gonna happen. Because <laughs> this was Monday at, um, 2, in, 2 p.m. So here's Monday, and two, this was 2 p.m., and here's where it closed, was down here. And I said, it's going to pop back to 700 ish What are you going to do when you're down another $50,000? Is it worth, like, sitting there and killing yourself? Why do you want to ride this out? You know it's a volatile, horrible stock. It's not worth it. And for us, why should we? Uh, uh, seriously, I mean, if, you, if you're down to $78,000, out of 80,000 possible dollars, what on earth would I want to be in that trade anymore for? It's not going to get that much better. You have to have a goal in a trade, and you have to, when you get to your goal, you have to say, okay, or you have to understand, like, you know, I could hate a stock, and I hate Tesla, but you have to recognize that it's not infinitely going to go down and it's not infinitely going to go up. No matter how much you love something, it's just like Apple. We got out of Apple when it topped out. I love Apple. Couldn't love Apple more than me. Got a 10-year track record plus of loving Apple. But that doesn't mean I'm an idiot. And when it goes up past a certain price point, when it gets to $2 trillion, I don't say, oh, well, that's a bit much. You know, I, lo I love a Range Rover, but don't tell me I got to pay $100,000 for one. Just, that, that's my limit. I'm sorry. I have, you know, I, I know what it's worth to me. And you have to know what it's worth to you, and you have to know what it's worth to other people who, who you need to sell it to eventually. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I swear we had a couple of new ones on Monday. Maybe not. Okay, wasn't wasn't Monday. Now we're back to Tuesday. So I reiterated our Pfizer play. And we add it to the dividend portfolio because it's stupidly cheap down here. That was yesterday, of course, we were talking about that on the main page. I also sent that out as a top trade because how could you not buy that? How could you not have Pfizer in every portfolio that you <laughs> that you can put it into? Um, Petrobras we put in the long-term portfolio. That's also stupidly cheap and it's popped from it popped all the way back up to 770 already. And don't forget, by the way, though, when, when they're thinly traded stocks, it could be us causing it. Don't get all excited. You know, it's like this could be just because we picked it and people started started accumulating it. Um, Lloyd's, I love also the great price on them. So that was worth it. Boy, we really paid. It's funny how <laughs> I'm really worried about the market, but I'm also starting. I'm finding some bargains. I have been looking really hard, though. Don't get too excited. Uh, I've been really combing through things and trying to figure out, like, who do I not mind owning? Uh, if the market corrects, but also who's going to pay us well if we don't correct, because we may never correct. Oh, and that was that for that. Okay, we already, we already went over today, so that's it for that. So it must have been last week. I know we had other um, 
other stocks we added, but I just remember what day. But basically, oh, that's weird. So basically, with the long-term portfolio, you know, it's kind of empty. And we'll take a look at that in a second. In fact, um, we we have plenty of room in it. We have plenty of cash. So I don't want to just sit there and do nothing. So my goal was to sort of find a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of plays, so that we don't miss out totally. If the rally continues and if things turn out great and if they and if they play the market perfectly, like I said, it's a Jenga game. You know, you don't know how high they're going to be able to get the thing, but if they could get a little bit higher. So what did we talk about last Thursday? Uh, da, 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 da. We looked at Roku. I was excited about Roku. Uh, Chipotle. Having a hard time coming back. Uh, TZA we talked about. SDS we talked about. The s p we talked about. I don't. Oh, you know what? I probably made it a top trade. That makes life easier, doesn't it? So here's Pfizer. Here's Gilead. Oh, last Monday. Holy crap. No, not last Monday. Two Mondays ago. So then we have this trade on Gilead, and um, that's a good one, too. We're well, doing uh, the actual stock. So 1,000 shares at 62 something. It's already at 64 something. So it's having a good time since then. And then we have the other kind of trade to lay out less money. Um, top trades for W, Wayfair short. Ooh, we wanted Wayfair short. That's not working. See that? That's interesting. They're holding up. That is a good short, though. I like that one. Um, inflation hedges. Wow. I'm crazy on those inflation hedges. Wheat and precious metals. That's a longtime favorite. They, they've gone down a bit since what what day was this from? February 8th. Wow, that was way over. So they've gone lower. Gold went, all these are good then. So you can play all these inflation hedges. OIH. Oh no, OIH has gone up. So oil services went up and Valero, holy crap, Valero went flying. <gasps> Wow, <laughs> it's like twenty up up thirty percent. So that one's that one's gone already. So Valera is already up. OIH is still probably playable. Uh, but anyway, so example wise, so what are we doing here? We added for, these are all added for the LTP. So here's Valero. It's twenty five thousand upside on this one. This one's got. $10,000 of upside. We want to collect the whole thing. Um, GOLD has uh, $14,000 of upside, but we didn't add that to one of our portfolios. Uh, short term period. All right, this one we put in the butterfly portfolio. Oh, we did do this in the, in the long term. Sorry. So here's a $14,000. So $14,000, $24,000, and um, 25000 It's like $50,000. And was there another one? And wheat and precious metals is another 14. So $64,000. So these four spirit, these four plays are good for $64,000 of upside. They don't necessarily need the market to do well. It's more of an inflation play, but obviously if everything else goes up, they should go up too. And and don't forget that's in, that's in a portfolio, although you know it's a 500000 dollars base portfolio so it's adding 10 percent you know if you're running it like a like how much money am i making off my base we're making more than 10 percent with just these four plays so we're done that's it that's all we have to do for the year so every quarter if we do 40 if we do 10 percent worth of plays by the end of the year we'll have 40 percent profit you know we'll be making 40 percent of the portfolio if we do that if we roll that to next year another 40 percent that's all you have to do to keep making money in the portfolio now, in this case, though, this portfolio has gotten huge. So now we're up 233%. We're up, we're up, we have a million, 1.6 million. This is a $500,000 portfolio. So we're up over a million dollars and we have it in cash. So there's no reason not to add these things. And what are we adding? We're adding a bunch of short puts, which we had empty short puts. And we're adding some sensible spreads. That's it. 
but that's what we do when, the, when that's what we do when we have the opportunity and they have very very few things to trade right now but at least we are finding some bargain basement stocks to play with and that's what's important you know we're still looking and if we see something great but i'm not forcing trades and and especially to you top trade people i just i'm not going to sit there and put up a trade just because i didn't put up a trade this month it's that's ridiculous I put up a trade when I see a trade I think has a high probability of winning. In this market, I don't see a lot of trades that have a high probability of winning. But as you can see, when we went through them, when we go through our top trades, I'm right. <laughs> okay, these, these trades are winning when we pick them, mostly. Here's Western Union, here's uh, Pfizer, of course, we like Pfizer. Here's IBM again. Here's gold again. Go keep going back to the same ones. I'm like, if they're not taking off, I'm gonna keep picking them. Here's Gilead again. <laughs> Here's Philip Morris, of course. They're flying. I mean, Altria, whatever the hell they call themselves, they're flying up. Um, you know, let's just make trades that work and make actual money. It's not about the quantity of trades. It's about the quality of the trades you make. And you know, the short-term portfolio was doing great. I dread to see what it did, it's did now, but. Um, the short-term portfolio was positive at the beginning of the week, and now it's, oh, it's still positive. Positive is fantastic. So that means that once again, we have insanely amounts of money because we have 1.6 billion in the, uh, 1.6 billion, 1.6 million in the long-term portfolio and 228 now in the short-term portfolio. So we are now at like 1.8 something million dollars. That's insane. That is completely insane because the short-term portfolio has not taken a lot of damage uh, because the NAS because we're very Nasdaq heavy and the Nasdaq on the whole has been down. So and even but even so the long-term portfolio is recovering and moving forward. So that's good and that's why you have the hedges. The hedges prevent you. In other words, the hedges allow us to ride the long-term portfolio out through a dip like the one we just had from last week. And let's take a look at that. So because we have hedges, and, and this isn't the first time we've, we've had a dip, of course, but because we have hedges, you know, we initiated the long-term portfolio here. We didn't buy a lot here. We bought like crazy here. This is why we're up so much. We bought like crazy when it dropped because we had only started buying positions and because the way you buy positions in a portfolio is to start slowly with small amounts that you're happy to double down on when they get cheaper rather than this being a problem for us we were ecstatic when the market drops in the in the beginning of last year as we will be again because now we have a million dollars cash and we're well hedged but the hedging allows us to ignore this and ignore this and ignore this and not not just ignore though but actually take advantage of so you know we had a we had a pretty severe downturn 39.50 to 37.23 is 200 points more than five percent so we had a nice five percent correction in the last couple of weeks and now we snap right back up but we don't have our finger on the sell button on our long-term positions. I mean, we've been paring them down and we only keep the ones that we really like, but still got 20 something positions open and we have, we're not inclined to take them off the table. Even getting to the 200 day moving average, which is a 10 to 15% correction, we're not taking things off the table. Why? Because our short-term portfolio would cover it. So we can ride out you know, and I'm not saying I'm not saying right out no matter what, but when we think the correction is going to then level off and go back, I've got two years, 18 months on these long-term plays. I don't care if we test the 200-day moving average and then go in this channel, which is still rising. These are, I don't get these are things that are true. I don't care if we hold this channel. So if we hold this channel, I don't care. If we move back up in this channel, I don't mind if this channel is still rising if the channel starts turning down if we are below the channel and poking and consolidating at the bottom of it then i'm more inclined to get out but we can do that because we've got the short-term positions 
in the short we got the short positions in the short term portfolio we have 200 and blah 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 thousand dollars in the short term portfolio now and we've got 1.6 in the long term portfolio you know obviously we we don't expect to keep it but we would end up with 400,000 let's say let's say we drop down to here we have 400 500,000 in the short term portfolio and maybe 1.1 1 1.2 in the in the long term portfolio you know, drop like 30%. Don't forget, we're mostly cash. So it's pretty drastic to lose 300,000 bucks. Um, and then we could, then we could start cashing out. So will we lose some money? Of course, we'll lose some money, but only 10, 20% of what we have. And what we have is ridiculous gains. But also, we don't have to be forced into making quick decisions because we have that balance. And that balance is the key to everything. That's what, that's what allows us to make clear decisions over time rather than having to sit there and feel pressure on any given day because the market did this or that and what we don't have in the long-term portfolio though is nasdaq positions um we we are not heavy in the nasdaq um NASDAQ, of course, is a four-letter stock, so we do have Alibaba, who we think is, is pretty cheap, but they're not doing well, not not doing well for our thing. But our target, we have, our target for Alibaba is 300. We're below that. You know, we we either have to decide to walk away from this or stick with it at some point. Uh, not a NASDAQ stock, not a NASDAQ stock. Cisco's a NASDAQ stock. Um, Gilead's a NASDAQ stock. Gold is a NASDAQ stock, actually. Uh, uh, IMAX, Intel, NASDAQ stocks, well, I mean, we have some NASDAQ stocks. Um, SunPower is a NASDAQ stock. That's it though. So five or six out of five or six out of 20 something. So so less than a quarter of our portfolio is in the NASDAQ. And we're heavily uh, we're heavily hedged on the NASDAQ. So you know, you gotta be aware of what's gonna happen to your portfolio if the market starts going down. You've got to be looking for that kind of stuff. You have to think about what am I going to do if this happens? Just like I said about the Tesla thing to Jay the other day, I, I said, what are you going to do when it pops? That's how you have to base your decision. Do I, do I want to hold this? Don't think about, do I want to hold this now? Because I think it's going to, I'm going to make the extra money. Yeah, of course, you probably are going to make the extra money. But during the time between now and when those short calls expire worthless, you will probably experience a, there will be a time because we were in the bottom of the channel at 600 there will be a time when you'll pop back up to 800 in the still in the same channel still low in the channel but you go back to 800 which is uh 33 percent above 600 and those freaking 1100 puts are going to jump up in price do you still want to be in it then you have to think about the whole thing not just the part you like. You have to think about what you don't like and what you're going to do during the entire time you own a position. And that's the key to riding out these crazy markets. It's really thinking about it. It's like it's like looking at a roller coaster and deciding if you want to ride it or not, right? Because like, okay, I, I'll do that. I'll do that. I don't mind that. Oh, but that's no, you know, you see the double loopy thing. And you say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> that's the end i'm out my head is what i do with my kids i'm like you know what i'll do one loop i will not do double loops and if it's double loops it's i know that's what i whip my neck around too much um you know any anything upside down is annoying to me <laughs> i will not do go two upside downs in a row that drives me crazy uh, cause I, cause I, you know, the one thing and it's over and I can enjoy the ride. It's like, I know it's going to happen. I know I'm not going to like it, but it's over real fast. And then you enjoy it. But if I know there's another one coming right after that, no, thank you. Um, you have to be expecting what's going to happen on the ride and you can't expect only good stuff. You have to expect the worst case scenario. And if you're comfortable with the worst case scenario, then you should play. But if you're not comfortable with the worst case scenario, don't start. That's how you, you know, that's how you maintain your portfolio balances. And you gotta, you gotta be ready for anything basically. And the hedging is so, so important.
ask no questions. Okay, we are winding this thing down shortly, so uh, I got to get out of here at 2.30. So I'm letting you know, fair warning. Uh, let's see if anything else exciting is going on. Don't think there is, though. Charts, no futures, no. Okay, yes, bonds. We, we're, we're really getting... Uh, Got to look at the bigger picture. It's funny, you know, you look at that and go, "Wow, look at those things go up." But then you look at the pic, the bigger picture, and it's like, "Ooh, <laughs> this is really collapsing bonds." These are the, these are the bond prices. So you know, if you hold a bond, you want it to be higher, and it'll be higher when the rates are going lower. When the rates are trending higher, as I explained this morning, it's not good for your bonds. And uh, so I said, oh, there's a, a there's a huge problem with containers and shipping. There's a lot of stuff backed up everywhere, and there's a problem. They're running out of containers. So the cost of a container, the the actual container, has gone up from like a thousand dollars to six thousand dollars or something like that to ship a container. The container itself, the thing you put the stuff in, um, that's basically the way they do the shipping charge. It has gone up ridiculously. Now, the problem with that is if you're shipping bulky light things like paper towels or toilet paper or, or I don't know, what things that are, you know, you know what I mean, fluffy stuff, things, things that are cheap and big, that's a big problem for containers, right? Because you're, you're, you're not going to get your bang for your buck. You can only put so many paper towels in a container and then you have to spread the $6,000 cost over less than 6,000 paper towels. That's why paper towels are so expensive. That's why things like that are expensive. Um, if something's dense, it doesn't matter. For, you know, for an Intel chip, the, the, you're gonna put 50,000 chips in a container and it's gonna cost uh, uh, two bucks a chip or whatever to pay, I'm, not, no, I'm sorry, it costs cost 10 cents a chip to pay the container and the chips are $1,000 each has absolutely no effect on the price, but things that are bulky and get shipped overseas, big, big problem. The ships are getting expensive, the containers are getting expensive. Um, that's because they they, they, they they mothballed a lot of ships, they took a lot of ships offline, commerce is picking back up. Um, there's a lot of shipping of things that weren't shipped before, like PPE equipment, masks, gloves, so on and so forth. It's a whole new category of stuff that's being shipped all over the world, taking up space in the containers and taking up space in warehouses. Um, all that is really uh, distorting the economy. And that's, and that's a funny thing to look at because, you know, you, you look at, container costs and shipping costs and you say oh that's an economic positive obviously if container rates are going up that must mean we're shipping a lot of stuff but what if you're shipping stuff you've never shipped before and and this happened by the way when we started shipping bottled water it caused a big distortion in uh shipping costs and shipping rates because now all of a sudden we're sending containers of water across the across the ocean we never did that before that was stupid what a stupid waste of money we still do it though. <laughs> it's a stupid, wasteful, ridiculous thing to do. You take water from here and you send it to France and they take water. You know, we send Poland Spring to France, they send Volvic water to here. Um, it's ridiculous. Um, Fiji's like number one export is water. <laughs> it really is crazy. Um, and, and you know, you, I mean, to put water on a ship just to have somebody drink it somewhere else. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it's it's nonsense. Um, but anyway, trade is trade, so whatever. But the point is, when you start doing things like that, you distort the trade because you can't compare apples to apples. All this PPE stuff is just from this year, and there's massive. You think about how many gloves and gowns and masks and things are going on everywhere and being shipped all over the world. And there, it's a lot of shipping, too, because they're almost all made in Asia. Pretty much all of them made in somewhere in Asia. They all ship to Europe and America uh constantly so that's taking up a large amount of shipping space and they're bulky things um so that that's you can't compare last year's shipping to this year's shipping when you have a whole new item or a new set of items that are being shipped so uh there, there's other forces so, so in other words you you can't directly say 
oh, the economy is better because of this. It's like, not necessarily. I mean, obviously the economy is picking up, but there's other factors involved that, that, that most economists uh, just don't consider because they, they, just, they, don't, cause they don't think. They don't really read enough. They don't look at things enough. And they just go by what they learned in school. And they say, well, if this is happening, then this is happening. And it's not necessarily true. But what it is doing is it's driving up the price of the commodities. Now, driving up the price of the commodities makes the same analysts, the same lazy analysts, will look at the price of commodities going up and go, oh, demand must be going up and blah, blah, blah. No, the demand for coffee is not going up. The demand for sugar is not going up. The demand for cotton, lumber, blah, blah, blah. Lumber is actually, well, lumber you can see from the housing that there's not more housing. We're not building houses. Honestly, think to yourself, how many houses do you see being built? This is not the same. When 2008, before the crash, in 2008, you saw houses being built everywhere you went. Somebody was building a house. Every single lot was being was being built on. That's not the case at all right now. There is not a lot of building activity going on. Um, lumber is not hugely demanded. It's the cost of shipping the lumber that's going through the roof. It's the cost of shipping cotton, the cost of shipping coffee, the cost of shipping sugar, all the shipping costs are going through the roof. And like I said, bulky things where you have to spread the cost of the shipping container across a, a low cost item, that's a problem, right? If, 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 if coffee, if sugar is measured in pounds and you can fit 3,000 pounds of sugar in a container, and a container is $6,000. Now you have to take $2 per pound and add it to the price of sugar. That makes sugar more expensive. It's a commodity. You pay for the delivered cost of a commodity. So, but the thing, so you have, you have, and, and that's a snowball effect too, because you have several things, because these, these uh, analysts, We'll look at the uh, price of shipping, they'll look at the price of commodities, and they'll say, oh, well, that must mean we have a very healthy economy because there's a lot of shipping and commodity prices are going up and therefore this and that. But that's based on a static model that doesn't exist anymore. There are other factors. There is new competition for shipping containers coming from a source that's never been done before. There's been no expansion in the amount of shipping containers. Therefore, the price of shipping containers starts going through the roof. Not only that, the cargo vessels, uh, oil is being stored on ships. That's driving the cost up as well. Uh, we're out of warehouse space. Warehouse space is getting expensive also. And again, why? Because we're filling up warehouses with freaking masks and gloves and gowns and blah, blah, blah for, for PPE and, and, and lotion. All these things that were not being bought last year. But nobody puts that into their model because they're lazy, because most of these people who are analysts and economists, they don't know how to make a model. They only know how to look at a model. If you don't understand how to make a model and you don't understand what the components are that go into the model, you don't really understand the model. And so you got to think about these things when you're looking at the economic health and you're looking at what's driving everything. It's, it's a lot of misinformation and it's consistent misinformation. And you read it and, you know, because I, I, I read a lot of stuff and, you know, you guys know I put stuff up. I guess I should maybe comment more sometimes, but sometimes I put up something that's glaringly wrong. Sometimes I put up things that's right. <clears throat> Most of the time, though, when I read an article that's flawed, I don't put it up. I don't consider that news. I'm like, I'm like this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, you know, gold, silver, the, these, these are these are the precious metals. You have to think about where they're coming from. How are they getting to the, how are they getting into your hands? What kind of journey do they take to get there? What factors are affecting it? Um, China uh, very much uses copper as a, a collateral, and that drastically affects the price of things in China. And, and so China has cracked down on lending, and, lending, and lenders are demanding more collateral, which means more and more people want copper to show as collateral. Uh, you know, things that we don't even think about here. We don't show gold and copper and silver as collateral for, for, for purchasing a you know, when we're getting a loan from a bank, we don't show a bank a warehouse full of copper and say, there's our collateral. But in China, they build so much that these builders have warehouses filled with copper. And then the copper is obviously worth something. It's easily worth 250. <coughs> so the bank is happy to say, that's your collateral. And you have a warehouse full of uh, copper, 250. It's worth $8 billion. That's your collateral for this $8 billion loan. We don't do that. We only order what we need when we need it. 
But these guys stockpile stuff. Very different environment. Then you look at gold and silver and you have to consider the fact that Bitcoin is sucking up the money from the gold and silver market. And it's being, so now we have, again, the same thing. What do we have now that we didn't have before? We have an alternate uh, monetary hedge, an alternate dollar, dollar hedge, and that's Bitcoin. It didn't exist a year or so ago. So if we go back on these charts, Back here, you know, Bitcoin, there was Bitcoin, but not Bitcoin at $50,000, Bitcoin at $10,000 here. Now Bitcoin $50,000 means there's 20 million, you know, there's there's 20 million um, Bitcoins, right? So you got 20 million Bitcoins times $50,000, well, times, let's say 40,000 more than before. So 20 million times 40,000 is 800 billion, so almost a trillion dollars of new Bitcoin, of mon I'm sorry, a trillion dollars of valuation has gone into Bitcoin, and where? Out of gold. Out of gold, out of silver, out of other things you would have put your money into. So the most similar things are gold and silver, so that's impacting the gold and silver trade to some extent. So gold and silver would both probably be a lot higher, except people started plowing money into Bitcoin instead. If Bitcoin pops, if the Bitcoin bubble bursts, if so, if you have Bitcoin, I strongly suggest hedging with gold. Because if the Bitcoin bubble bursts and people start liquidating, where are they gonna put their money? They clearly don't like dollars. They're gonna put it into something else. What are the something else's you would put your money into? Well, you're not gonna put it into bonds because those are a freaking disaster, right? Uh, housing's still iffy. You know, don't, and, and the market is highly, it's extremely overvalued. I don't think there's too many people disputing that at this point. Uh, well, it's up 500 points today, so maybe, maybe there are. Or well, the Dow's up 500, but I think the Dow's up because of Boeing, right? Is Boeing having another really good day? Because Boeing turned positive with their water flow and all kinds of good stuff that's going on over there. Um, do, 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 do. Oops, got to go. Got a meeting. Boeing. Yeah, Boeing's having a nice run. I mean, look at Boeing. So Boeing going from 150 to, two, to 250. So it's 100 points. So Boeing, uh, it's it's eight each Dow point, each Dow dollar is 8.5 Dow points. So times 100, obviously, is eight, 850. So Boeing is accounting for a good $800 of the Dow's gain since November. Okay, and then you look at the Dow. It's a lot more than 850, but so since November, we were at 28,000 and now we're at 32,000, so 4,000. So one quarter of the Dow's total gain since, or 20% or, or basically, I guess one fifth. So one fifth of the Dow's total gain since November has been Boeing, one stop. You know, and that's why the Dow is a stupid index, but it just gives you kind of an idea of what's going on. So, wow, Boeing, Boeing with a nice comeback, though. I mean, crap. I don't remember. I, I, I don't know. That was my fault. I should. We should have. We should have bought it. That's the bottom line. I think we had it for a while. I don't remember though. It seems wrong that we don't have it. I mean, there there is ample opportunity to get into Boeing when it was super low. I think we had it for a while, but I don't remember. I just feel very silly for not having it, I, and, I, and I won't get it now. Now it's kind of chasey. But um, you know, it's it's Boeing. It's the one of one of two real plane makers in the world. So of course that's going to be good. And people, you know, you have to fly. The world is not built for not flying. We we built the world around flying for the last fifty years, seventy years. Um, you can't undo that. This is, this is a world that's been built for flying. Somebody has to get from one place to another. Your family does not live in one place. We haven't had that mindset for our entire lives. That has been 
It has not been important that we're all within driving distance of each other. And, um, you know, you have events, you have family events, you have work events, you have things that you have to fly to. So there's a thing where you have to fly to things. And obviously you don't have to, you all went a year without flying, but basically, you know, and frankly, even the year without flying, these airlines have still been, uh, there's still people flying. And so there are a lot of things you have to do. You know, someone dies with COVID, you, some people, you have to go to the funeral, depends on who it is. Um, you know, supplies are flown by air. We have, we have uh, our logistics, and the, oh, there, there's a good example. In fact, probably a, a third of air travel is, is uh, shipping. And we, we, we ship tons of stuff by air. We can't stop. You can't stop shipping things by air. And, and your mail and all your envelopes and, the, and the, the way you can work at home and get your stuff is because people are sending things by FedEx and so on and so forth and it all travels by air. You know, we can't stop flying. Planes will fly. Boeing will make planes. That doesn't go away. You can't, the only way you can do that is if the next two or three generations, we all try to move back closer and keep work and family and everything in a certain, within driving distance, within the distance of an electric car, rather than airplane distance. And then you're gonna go back to a system where, where it's very rare for somebody from the East Coast to go to the West Coast and so on and so forth. It's highly unlikely that we're gonna go back that way. So, you know, again, so again, my bad, because I mean, that's a, it's just one of those things where why would we not have Boeing for the long term? So I don't remember why that was, but that's a, a mistake that we made for sure, because that's the kind of stuff you do want to invest in. You want to think about how badly damaged can this be? Now, of course, they had a whole plane issue and so on and so forth. You don't know what the damage it's going to be. I know I know why I was hesitant, but I, I don't understand why we didn't end up having Boeing. That was kind of silly. So on that note, unless anybody's got a question, let's see. Oh, no extra questions. So, okay, great. On that note, we're going to call it a day. I will do it again next week. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. All right, talk to you all later. Thanks.